Max Olson of The Athletic joins us now. This is kind of what we would call like the Max After Dark segment based on usually he's on earlier in the show, but now, now it's later so he can really let it fly and just say, you know, what's on his mind. He doesn't have to worry about the censors. Um, but Max, uh, a very guys, guys I ha- I, just to be clear, I have not been drinking. I, I don't know <laughs> what the implication is, but I have not been drinking today. Uh, Max, it's five uh, o'clock somewhere. Yeah, almost five. Almost <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here. Uh, but Max, the, an interesting week for college football news and litigation and private capital or equity or whatever. Uh, what to you jumped out as kind of the more the most staggering story of the week? Um, good question. Um, I think, you know, certainly the, you know, we're heading towards resolution here on, on this house settlement. Um, I think obviously there's a ton of details to get figured out here over the next, you know, year. Um, and you know, certainly like you, you, you definitely wonder what the collective bargaining piece of this is going to look like. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's obviously a historic moment for college athletics to, um, for, for them to finally be backed into a, you know, solution here that involves revenue sharing. So, um, you know, there's, there's aspects of that that are exciting. I, I honestly, though, I think I was probably a little more in, intrigued in some ways by, um, the, by the, the Drew Weatherford story, the, um, the private equity story that, that Ross Salinger had on Yahoo this week. I, I think that, um, that it's been clear here for a little while now. Um, that there were going to be people who were going to try to step in to the mix here and offer athletic departments large sums of money um, in order to help them get through this next, you know, to, to, to kind of help bridge them through this next era where we're, we're still like coming back from, you know, COVID financially. And then you're heading into a future where you've got this new, you know, 20 million plus line item in your budget. How are we going to handle this? So, you know, Will there be, you know, ACC or Big 12 or Group of Five athletic departments that um, get involved with this and take this money? And, and what does that mean for their futures? Um, that that you know that is, it certainly feels like that is another story that's coming here in terms of uh, uh, something we got to keep an eye on. That things that you would never imagine many years ago that uh, are now very real. Yeah, no doubt. That, that is very interesting, and it kind of depends on who you talk to, at least initially, on whether it's a good idea or not, right? Like, the people who love to, sure, yeah. to pump in money are like, no, it's a great idea. There's nothing wrong with it. And those who know a little bit more, maybe have been burned, are like, this is an awful idea. So I, I tend to think that it probably falls somewhere in the middle, and I'm intrigued to, to hear more about that for sure. We've also seen a, a new little, uh, I guess, thing in in, in recruiting here lately, Max, uh, where – with a Cormani McLean, uh, for example, M- Mikhail Harrison Pilot out at Texas Tech, players who were on scholarship somewhere now not being on scholarship, at least initially at their new schools, a, a new way as college coaches try to always find an advantage to kind of play the scholarship limits a little bit. We've also heard, though, about the possibility moving forward of scholarship reductions. Do you have any particular thoughts on on scholarships and kind of how all that may be used in the future and just, to, you know, kind of how teams are, are – finding ways to, to even get around the, the limits we have imposed right now. Yeah, I think I think I noticed that he, this is even the case at Baylor, I believe, when Steve Linton transferred from Texas Tech to Baylor, I believe in the portal he was listed as a walk-on. And, and again, I, I don't know if um, – I, 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 you know, certainly we have – there's there's more room now. Uh, I know Nebraska is one school that's doing this where you can just have your collective pick up the, the, the school bill and you right. can go over the 85. Um, so – I, you know, I think we are seeing collectives doing that a little bit. And, you know, sometimes that's just a, you know, just a roster management thing and those guys will be on scholarship at, at some point or whatever. Um, but, you know, that there's certainly, there, there, there is the ability, if you've got the collective, if you've got the money, you can go over 85. And there, I know some STC teams do do this. Um, and I know it's probably a little bit weird to the player and their parents and stuff, because it's like, wait, does that mean I'm not worthy of a scholarship here? Or what's that, what is that saying? But like, um, I, I think there's a, there's ways to be creative and, and, and I think that's kind of a net positive because it also means that those programs are, you know, at the end of the spring, not cutting a bunch of players to get down to 85 and stuff. And so um, maybe that there's fewer runoffs with that scenario. So um, that, that I don't think is necessarily a, a, a bad thing, um, but it does, you know, and, and we haven't really seen somebody just come out and say like, all right, we're going to have a hundred scholarship players this year and right. the collective is going to pay for 15 of them. But uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot more flexibility now. And, and yeah, you do wonder, like, 
what is the future model going to look like in terms of uh, scholarship limits? I, I think that when you talk to coaches, I think they're pretty happy with where things are at right now. The fact that they have the, the ability to fully manage the 85 and lose everybody that they – or replace everybody that they lose. I think that's viewed as a real positive. I, obviously, that's led to way more transfers uh, year year after year. Um, but I, I, I don't – you don't talk to a lot of coaches who are like, man, I'd love to cut this back. So, yeah, that, that part will be very interesting. But do you, I, I mean, that's part of the thing that's been widely reported is that foot, like everybody else could gain scholarships in this, like baseball. That rule was very outspoken about yeah. the, the walk ons. Yeah, know, that like, that, but like the football could lose it. And right. he even said, like, do we even need, do we even need 85 anymore? Like, just when you're talking about having a budget for a roster. Yeah. And I think, you know, look, I think, I think there are some coaches that look at this. Now, obviously, Matt Rule just came from the NFL. So he probably, cares a little bit more about the 53 than the 85 when it comes to, you know, when you get in season, it's time to actually prepare for uh, your opponents and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that like, there are some things like the, the fact that, you know, baseball programs still aren't just fully funded. is like, it's still kind of crazy to me. And like, if you can get that to a sport where, you know, everybody's on scholarship, like, I think that's a, that's a positive thing for sure. But like, yeah, there's, there's a lot to work out there. And obviously you know, when you when you see these like the settlement talks and stuff, obviously the attention goes to football and the attention goes to the Power Four or Power Five leagues. Um, but there's the, the the fallout of this stuff is uh, is very far reaching and and certainly not just like Division One. So with Matt Rule's comments about the uh, you know he said they have like a hundred and however many uh, like 145 players or something on the roster right now. So he doesn't yeah. want a roster limit that would mean like, okay, if you got 85, that means you got like 85, 86, 90 players maybe on your roster. He wants to have the ability to, to have these walk-ons. I mean, how detrimental yeah. would that would something like that be to uh, the, the tradition that is Nebraska football in particular with, with the walk-on program? I, I just feel like that's another thing where, where to his point, you're kind of losing uh, not only opportunities for guys to just grow as men, but also that, I think feel like that's another part of the tradition of college football that you're starting to chip away at a little bit as well. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and and um, you know, I think that look, I think it's tougher in this in this era to have a really strong walk on program, um, you know, because not not just because you know guys can easily transfer to situations where they are put on scholarship, um, but because I think you know as college gets more expensive too, you just have like here here in Nebraska, you know, there's there's some good players in in you know Omaha and and Lincoln and, and you know other areas that like why would that kid go walk on when he can go to like one of the South Dakota or, or North Dakota schools, which are very competitive in FCS and like can, can give you financial aid and stuff like that or, or Northern Iowa or whatever. So I think that that, that is getting a little bit tougher nowadays for programs to have like a walk on program. That is a true strength. Like it was with Osborne of like, man, that they're doing that better than anybody. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, again, and, and, and that's like true walk ons guys that just come into your program, not guys that you've recruited and, you know, somebody else is paying for it. Um, I, I think it's just harder to keep that nowadays. It's harder to manage a roster of like 150. Um, that doesn't mean that, that there should be like hard cutbacks and, and limits that kind of, you know, make it impossible to have uh, much of a walk-on program. But yeah, I, I think from a tradition standpoint, you're right. I, I don't think that's something that people really uh, want to see. Like walk-ons are generally a pretty a pretty harmless thing in college football and, and, and to take away, you know, opportunities. Um, you don't want to see that. Max, uh, what do you make of a college football coach being sued over NIL? Uh, I'm not, I mean, I mean, you know, not surprised. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised at all. I, I, you know, the, the, you know, certainly we, we spent a lot of time um, reporting on Jane Machado last year at the athletic. And so, you know, and, and a lot of the details that, you know, or in the lawsuit or details you, you could read last year. So I think, you know, that, that, um, you know, that stuff, I'm, I'm glad that stuff did come to light last year and I'm glad that he was not stuck in, you know, he was able to trans, you know, get out of his uh, letter of intent and not be stuck in a situation where he was not at all getting paid what he was promised. And, you know, frankly, guys, I, I'm just surprised we don't see this all the time mm -hmm. um, because you, you hear from talking to people on the personnel side, talking to coaches, you hear anecdotally all sorts of stories of, oh, this guy went to this school and they promised him, you know, this, this, and this, and he got there and he he got a fraction of that. Like you hear that all the time, and you've been hearing that throughout the NIL era. So it's it's it, in some ways 
I mean, yeah, this is a very gaudy thing that a $13 million contract is insane. And, you know, that, that, that it made it a very big lightning rod thing because this kid was, um, you know, a high profile quarterback recruit. He was really shopped around on the, in the NIL marketplace and stuff. Um, but I'm surprised we don't see a lot more of this stuff. Um, you, you like players should, and their families should speak up when um, they get hosed on these deals or they go to places and, and uh, you know, get, get lied to. Like, I think that, that uh, you, they should ha- use their voice and put that out there. And so, you know, it's, it's a, obviously, you know, for Billy Napier, it, it, it makes a tough situation there even tougher. And, uh, you know, certainly if he made a promise of we'll give you a million dollars if you send your letter of intent, like that's the kind of stuff that the NCAA will investigate too. So, um, and they've already begun that. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, the hot seat was uh, – the seat was already extremely hot in Gainesville, and uh, this definitely doesn't help. So Paul started off by asking you, like, which story that's out there is, is kind of like, I guess, the, the most interesting. But I have to say, I, I feel like in, in looking over your timeline a little bit earlier and just seeing some of your responses as well, the thing you're most excited about is NCAA, the video game, right? I mean, that is the... Yeah, there's, there's no question. Yeah, like, so what, what's it been like to see all of the teases, the trailer drop, uh, hearing about some of the details? Like, what are you most excited for? And just uh, how pumped up are you on, on a scale of 1 to 10? Yeah, I mean, right now, uh, my, my current feeling is extreme jealousy uh, because um, my colleague Chris Manini and Andy Staples and Bud Elliott and Matt Brown, a bunch of guys were in Orlando this week and uh, got to play the game today and uh, learn a ton about what's in the game. And I was not one of those people. So uh, right now, a lot of FOMO. Uh, we're working through that. Um, but no, I, I'm, I'm stoked. Yeah, I, 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 that's just a video game I loved since I was a kid. And uh, it probably, um, in, in some deep down way, probably factored into what I've ended up doing for a living just because I, I loved uh, playing that game so much and, and loved the sport. And so, um, yeah, couldn't be more excited for that to come out. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, like, it, it's just, it's just, you saw the trailer last week is some of the stuff is just kind of jaw dropping. Um, Cause it's just been so long. And uh, like, you forget, you know, McLean stadiums never existed in a video game, right guys. Mm-hmm. Like there's, you know, the, yep. and the current uniforms and all that kind of stuff, like just bringing this stuff up to date. Um, that alone is super exciting. And I, I think the gameplay will be, will be great. And, uh, and dice and all that. So yeah. Um, you know, when we hit July 19th, um, I'm probably going to cancel a bunch of these radio interviews and just disappear for a few weeks. So I, I think that's probably how it's going to go. Well, I mean, it's right after media days are over, right, Max? So that's right. Yeah, that's so you, right. You, you'll have a little runway uh, to do that. But yeah, I, I, I need. I'm, I'm upset that you were not included in that group. I, I think those well, are, okay. those are your that's peers, okay. and uh, you're, you're, you have that same amount of juice. So I mean, I mean, I, I think Chris, Chris that told me he got to play the game for like two hours today. I, I'm, I'm, I will lap him in terms of uh, time spent on that game very quickly once it once it hits. So uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna invest some real real solid time into that. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure your listeners are excited too. I think that uh, the folks at EA do a great job, and uh, you know, very very optimistic. And honestly, if the game's terrible, I'm still gonna defend it with my life and, and say it's the best because we've just waited this long. And uh, I'm I'm just looking for all the good in it. Yeah, the big surprise you have to play with an old Atari style joystick. Like that's <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's gonna be. Max, thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, guys. All right, Max Olson of the Athletic with us here on 365 Sports. Yeah, I don't, there's not much that it's not.